Better System Trader, Episode 8. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader podcast, episode 8. Today's guest has been trading the market since 1989, spending thousands of hours researching the market, stocks and technical analysis criteria to understand what works and what doesn't. His work has been widely referenced and quoted over the years, having been featured on TV, radio and print, including Sky News, ABC Radio, Your Trading Edge, Switzer Daily and the ASX. In today's chat, we discuss market timing why it works, the impact it can have on strategy performance, and simple methods you can use yourself. We also have a really interesting discussion about the misinformation published by some fund managers and how you can outperform the majority of professional fund managers using very simple techniques. We also chat about the importance of perspective and how it can improve your trading, and we get some tips on one of the most important components to executing your training plan correctly. Let's get to it. Today's guest is Gary Stone. Hope you enjoy it. Gary Stone, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Andrew. Could we please start with a little background on how you got into trading? Uh, many years ago. It's, uh, it seems quite a long time ago now, but in my late 20s, uh, I was a working for a large uh, multinational computer company uh, providing uh, mainframe hardware and uh, and system solutions, uh, large uh, solutions like billing systems and accounting systems and things like that for large government and uh, and commercial organizations and did fairly well at it. It is a um, high commission environment and generated some some cash out of it and, and then I got to a point where I was about 27, 28. And I started asking myself the question as to where would I invest this this extra cash we had. At the time, we didn't own any property or, or anything like that. So I, I started getting into the um, what are the investment avenues and very quickly came up with uh, stock market or financial markets, uh, property or, or cash slash bonds. And uh, the uh, we went. We, I did. I have invested in property. I've owned uh, three investment properties over the years. Uh, but I've uh, and I started off immediately also looking at the stock market with fundamental analysis primarily, and technical analysis. But the the bug bit me uh, well and truly uh, along the financial market status. So I, I started that in in the 88 89 t- time frame, but only really placed my first trade. In late 1989, when I was uh, I was 29 years old, so that's what started. That's what that was. What the catalyst and the motivation was 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 having uh, having some spare cash to invest and in, trying to find a home for it and what the best avenue was for it. Right. Okay. So, how would you describe your style of trading uh, today, and how did you get from being a, a fundamental analyst uh, to to what you're doing now? The the path was was one of was certainly one of discovery as as I think most people uh, most people have, I think also who I am and the type of person I am would have played a role in that, but the first few years was was uh, undoubtedly a focus on fundamental analysis, reading balance sheets, uh, and financial information and all the different accounting ratios and trying to uh, pull them together and uh, and work out uh, what sort of criteria led you to being in stocks that had a high probability of going up. Massively time consuming, uh, but at the same time I started uh, using technical analysis as well. And over a period of probably about four or five years, I slowly moved from having a, 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 a more deep set belief in technical analysis rather than fundamental analysis. Uh, and uh, that, that would have been through the, the whole period of the early 1990s that transition took place. Right, so the style of trading that you do now is uh, 100% technical, and I, I'm probably by I would say the mid 1990s, 95, 96, 97. That time frame, it went from being uh, discretionary technical to mechanical technical, 
the uh, you know in those days there were very few books around. There was obviously no internet. It was just starting up in the in the mid '90s. So that whole learning curve was uh, was one of uh, you know, me myself trying this out and and uh, running into all sorts of hurdles. Uh, the, there were associations like the Australian Technical Analyst Association that I joined in 1993, um, and have, because I had a business, I started a business in the mid 90s, having exposure to other experts out there um, that I managed to bump into both in Australia and internationally, uh, all played a major role in me coming to the this, the, the conclusion that the, that it might not be the best way, but it's the highest probability way. Of uh, of making of getting ahead in the markets is to is to take a mechanical technical approach. Right. So, how did your transformation from uh, discretionary to mechanical or systematic trading change the way that you viewed the markets? Uh, it it was profound. Uh, is probably the best word I, I could come up with. The the thing, I, I, whilst I do have a little bit of uh, um, extrovert in me, people tell me I think the 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 there's a bigger part of me that's left-brained and analytical. And that uh, mechanical trading lent itself to my way of thinking where I could, uh, I could put forward an hypothesis and, uh, and demonstrate or, or not necessarily prove because I don't think you can prove everything 100%, but I could come up with a hypothesis that was provable before I placed a single trade. And that, that appealed to me when I started uh, doing that in the mid-90s. Um, and putting forward hypotheses, concepts, principles, and then testing them uh, with with fi historical financial data across large samples of different kinds of financial data, and I was able to verify that the criteria that I'd put forward, I, I could see the results that came out of that. In a, in a when I say a short time frame, I mean in in uh, you know getting into a trade, getting out of a trade, and seeing a verifiable outcome. Whereas with fundamental analysis, you can't do that because the data really is only updated every six months. And the the lag between the change in data and what happens to the share price was probably many months. So it is very difficult to verify it. And, and also, I, there were no criteria that I could put my fingers on that were mechanical enough to say, right, I'll, I'll use those on, in, uh, in a systematic way going forward. So that that was it was profound that I could test and verify something and then take that into the market environment and actually execute it pretty closely to to what had been verified in the research phase. So it sounds like that verification process um, really uh, moved you to becoming more of a professional trader. What do you think are the main differences between amateur and professional traders? Well, in, in just a step before that, the, 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 the key difference, I think, was confidence. And, and that might even be the difference between professional and amateur traders as well, is that the verifiable results, uh, which included not only the criteria and when to buy and when, when to get in and when to get out, but also how much to put into a trade as well, so to, to how much of your portfolio to, to risk on a particular position, when you actually went into the real environment, you, you'd had you'd spent your time, you know, uh, in the nets or in the driving range, and and you'd you'd you'd, you'd you were able to acquire those skills, and uh, and visualize what may happen before you'd risked a single dollar. So when you actually get into the environment of risking a dollar, the uh, you have a lot more confidence, and and confidence, whilst it's a pretty difficult thing to put a finger on, is pretty in, in, uh, in, intangible. It plays a major role in how well you'll execute your plan and execute your your system. Uh, and if you don't have that confidence, you know, you're going to be second guessing. You're going to feel like you don't know what's going to happen. You're going to be feel like you're in the dark. Uh, you're going to feel like you're, you know, there's all these unknowns going on. Whereas if you've been able to verify it first, your level of confidence goes to a level whereby you know, don't guarantee outcomes, but what it does do is that there's a higher probability that you're actually going to execute your plan. That's a great analogy of uh, approaching the stock markets like, uh, you know, putting time into uh, playing in the nets or at the driving range just yeah. to get that confidence up. So that's, I think that's a great way to look at it. It's, it's preparation time. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah. So um, I'd just like to change uh, the topic for a little while. I'd like to ask you about an article that you posted on your blog on sharewealthsystems.com. Um, it was picked up by the media. The blog post was called Marketing Misinformation from the So-Called Investing Professionals. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's uh, it's one I – mean, I'm kind of uh, you know, on, a, on a bend here to expose 
the um, mutual funds, the managed funds, because they uh, there is a lot of misinformation they put out there, and not so much uh, misinformation in the actual information they put out, but it's the misinformation in what they leave out. Uh, and whilst they undoubtedly know this information, they choose not to share it with the investing public because obviously um, it would not do their cause any great good. So they, they choose to leave it out, but they undoubtedly know this information. And, and that one is is one that you see um, uh, around quite a bit. In fact, I even, I've seen it in articles, financial journalists writing on the same topic and, and using it as a justification uh, for people to buy and hold effectively. Um, and that is uh, the, what they, what they purport is that uh, over any 10 year period, if you miss the 10 best days uh, over a 10 year period, your results go to zero or even to negative. Um, so the, the, the example that I put in that, uh, in, in, that, in that blog was the Fidelity, uh, who are the largest uh, fund manager in the world by, by funds under management. Uh, they had said if you'd invested in the, in the MSCI index, the world MSCI index, over 10 years, you would have got a, I think it was about a 65% return. But if over those 10 years, you had missed just the 10 best days, your 65% return would have been wiped out to, to not only zero, but to minus 4% uh, in total. So you would have wiped out 70%. Uh, so if you'd started with $100,000, you would have had $165,000 after 10 years. And, and, uh, and if you had missed just the 10 best days over those 10 years, your 165 would have gone to 95, i.e. you would have lost, uh, or 96, you would have lost $4,000. So you know, to most people, that makes a bit of sense. They go, wow, therefore, you know, and, and what they're trying to put forward to you, the hypothesis they're putting forward is that you know, it's time in the market. Don't try and time the market because if you do and, and you miss those 10 days, then that's your entire investment gone. Right, and so uh, you actually went through and validated uh, those results and looked at the other side of the picture. And what did your results tell you? Well, the, the first thing an inquiring mind should think is, uh, right, those are the 10 best days, but what if I miss the 10 worst days? What would the outcome be? So you go, and it's not difficult to do the exercise with uh, you know, data off, off Yahoo and a spreadsheet uh, and just sorting, you just take the daily movements of, of, of the index that you're looking at and just sort them by the best and the worst, take out the worst, and then look at the equity curve. And what immediately found was that if you left in the 10 best and, and missed the 10 worst, you'd actually do far better than if you just bought and held for the 10 years. Uh, and what that immediately led me to think was, wow, there's more merit in, in missing the worst days than what there is for being in for the best days. So that now immediately supports the hypothesis that maybe timing you could do better. Right. So did you uh, go through and have a look at the distribution of those uh, best and worst days to see if there is uh, some kind of way that this can be applied to, to investing or trading? Yes, I certainly did. So, so immediately the, the, the next step in that is to think, well, what if I could time and miss the worst days but be in for the best days? And that then meant that what you had to do was look at, uh, at where the best and the worst days occurred in the market. And this, this is the real bit that I think um, the, uh, the, the, the misinformation comes from because no matter what 10-year period you look at, I, I tested this on both the All Ordinaries and on the S&P 500 over the 10-year period up until you know, last year. I even went and looked at 10-year uh, periods in the 19 uh, in the 1960s and 70s, which was a bit of a you know a, a big sideways moving market. I tested in the 1980s data where we had the 1987 crash, and there is one uh, bit of information that comes out that is uh, that is a, a would I would now term because there's a big enough sample that that proves this or demonstrates this. Uh, and this that principle is that the best and the worst days occur within days of each other. Uh, and that is a principle. That is a market principle that people can take out of this: is that you can't be in for the best days and out for the worst days. But also, and this is the this is where fidelity and these managed funds get it wrong, is that by being in for the best days, you are guaranteed to also be in for the worst days. That's interesting. So, what happens if you do manage to avoid the best and the worst days? 
Well, if you manage to invest, if manage to miss both the best and the worst, and you can, uh, so so if you're if you're if you set out with a goal to rather miss the worst days rather than be in for the best days, i.e., the exact it's a paradox. Do the exact opposite of what Fidelity are saying. Mm -hmm is because they're in close proximity to each other, so you set out your goal is miss the worst days, is you end up missing both the best and the worst. And if you do that, your returns are far, far better than just being in the market all the time. Right, so if the solution is to time the market so that you do miss the worst and best days, what type of techniques can we use to, to accomplish that? And you know, we're not talking about uh, you know, day trading here or being in and out every day or, you know, or whatever it might be, because the the, the way that these uh, the, the financial journalists and and the and the managed fund uh, advertising and and writing they do is that when they talk about timing, they are saying that you uh, they they are talking about short term trading and timing. Now I exactly I agree with them exactly what they say. It's extremely difficult to short term and uh, to short term trade the markets because in the short term there's noise, uh, and that noise is is mostly purely random. However, in medium to longer term uh, time frames, the undoubtedly trends occur that are not random, and what we want to do is is at a bigger picture level is try and be out uh, of the market for long-term, medium to long-term trends that run for many months and to be in for rising trends that last many, many months. Um, so we're not talking about uh, short-term trading here, in and out you know, every few days. We're talking about in and out every few months. And if you start using, and there are plenty of technical analysis tools around that can help people to time at that level, that doesn't require them to sit in front of a computer for hours a day. In fact, it might just be as short as you know, half an hour a week is the time required to 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 miss those uh, those best and worst days. Can you uh, discuss uh, some of those technical analysis tools that you're uh, talking about? Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly. Uh, before we do that, I just uh, I just like to emphasize the misinformation. Sure. Know, the misinformation that was put forward was that you know, be in the market so that you don't miss the best days. What I'm putting forward is the exact opposite of that, is uh, is to time the market, not to ensure that you're in for the best days, but to ensure that you're out for the worst days. So that is what we're trying to do. It's the exact opposite of what these people are, are, are putting forward. So, so some of the techniques that, that that I've used over the years is, is to, and, and you know, there, there are many technical analysis techniques, uh, but to use um, you know, weekly momentum indicators so to look at things like the um, the MACD, um, to look at momentum, uh, to look at um, we have an indicator which which is, is which is a momentum indicator or trend trend slash momentum indicator called this the um, SIROC S I R O C which stands for smoothed index rate of change. Uh, that's a technique that can be applied, but you know applied to weekly charts, not daily charts. Um, the other indicators that I would that, that I would say people need to look at is is the concept of relative strength. So comparing um, one index uh, or in the in the case of exchange traded funds or indices or even stocks to compare the movement of one a price action to another price action to get a relative movement, a relative strength on those. And uh, the indicators that are that I've spent quite a bit of time researching of late is uh, is um, swing swing charts. So so to to look at peaks peaks and troughs that are done on on three four five day swings, um, and what that does is cuts out a lot of the noise. And and another indicator which is which is you know, these are these are not um, you know groundbreaking indicators. They've been around for decades. Uh, is another one called uh, it's just to use an, an average true range. Um, which measures volatility to bring that into your into your, into your research as well, and and apply a, a trailing stop, a ratcheted trailing stop to to um, using volatility. So th those those are the main ones. There are others out there that, that people would use, and I'd throw some acronyms in here for people that are that are in 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 the in the game of looking at technical analysis. Is the um, is the ADX or the DMI, the directional movement. Uh, index uh, invented by Wells Wand Welder is another one that can be used. That also builds in a bit of volatility as well. So a combination of those, uh, of one or two of those, 
um, it, you know, people with some time and putting some time into research and preparation, you know, should be able to work out a, a basic timing mechanism that will achieve, you know, being out for the worst days. So if you were to recommend one indicator for traders to start researching, which do you think would uh, provide the best value? The um, it depends on your time frame. So if you whether you're short, medium, or longer term trading, it it does depend on your time frame. But for, for medium to longer term, so you're looking to get you know, be in for trends that last many weeks or or a few months, uh, I'd be looking at at swing charts. Um, so what well, yeah, what that does, looking at peaks and troughs, uh, and and just looking at the basic concepts of higher highs and higher lows, and and taking out of the, the equation short-term random movements. You know, short-term random movements is probably one of the biggest things that affects people's psychology uh, whilst they're executing any plan in the market you know, on a daily basis or two or three day basis. And what, what swing charts do um, where you, you, in taking out that, that daily, uh, daily noise, you, you can start seeing pictures of, of trends developing either, either up, down or sideways. That's one, so swing charts. Um, and the, the other one is, is a concept of, a, of volatility, so an indicator that, that does measure volatility, whether it be average true range or correlations uh, or um, you know, using historic volatility or standard deviation, some sort of volatility measurement and, and bringing that into, into the equation. That's interesting. I was actually going to ask about that because you said the biggest uh, winning days and losing days are all kind of in the same uh, period of time. So. Perhaps a volatility filter uh, can can assist in that manner. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, when we're talking volatility and, the, and those biggest and losing, those biggest, uh, those best and worst days, are um, the thing that stands out when you look at those periods is what the range of the daily bars are um, from high to low, um, and that, that's what uh, you know, volatility indicators such as average true range and standard deviation and, and that measure very well. And effectively, those are the periods you want to miss. Uh, and if you if you uh, if you start if the markets start becoming highly volatile, and you just look at over a two or three or four week period, uh, the range of the bars starting to widen, starting to get you know much much uh, deeper and 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 wider. Those are periods you want to be at because those are the periods where the best and the worst days over you know a long period are, are going to occur. And if you can avoid those, you're going to be avoiding the worst periods in the market. So you're saying compare the the short term volatility with a longer period to see if it's uh, there's a, an expansion in volatility there. That that's certainly one way of doing it. So a range of bars. Um, you know some some of the some of the um, the more popular option strategies do just that. Um, we're not talking option strategies here, but comparing a longer term historical volatility to a shorter term historical volatility. Uh, but I, I, for the the trend trading, that uh, trend following stuff that I do. Where we're focusing on at the moment, uh, you know, looking at focusing on, on exchange traded funds or indices and sectors that are not as volatile. Um, I, I'm just looking at the volatility and picking ranges. So, so what I, what I, what we do is we say um, is we look at the the volatility uh, and measure that volatility as a percent of, of of the of the of the index or the or the stock. So, for instance, if you um, if you've got a dollar movement. Uh, on a ten dollar stock, that's ten percent volatility. Uh, just to give an example, that would be very high. You wouldn't typically see that in an index unless you've got a crash going on. But uh, then you'd compare that to another time where there's a ten cent move uh, on a ten dollar stock, and that ten cent. When I'm talking about ten cent, I'm talking about from the high to the low, averaged over two or three weeks. Um, then rather than that being a 10% volatility, it's a 1% volatility. And that, and what you do is you compare the volatility now to what has been in the past and you can start working out what the current characteristics of this price action, whether it be a stock or an index, what the current volatility characteristics are compared to what they've been in the past. And you can then see how the personality and the character of the price action of that particular stock or index is now compared to the past, and you can then put some timing mechanisms on that. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks for that. Um, those are tips. Uh, in your own trading, when you get a signal that um, that the market um, is not ideal, using one of these market timing techniques, what do you do with any open trades that you have? 
If, if I'm trading a, a, a stock portfolio, um, the way that I do it is I exit the market 100%. So, so when we get a, a market risk environment whereby it's, it's an exit on the market, then the, uh, what, what, we, what that's telling us is that there's a high probability that we're going to move into a high volatile en environment. Uh, and there's a probability, there's a higher probability that uh, we might get a, um, you know, get into a worst day scenario, which we're trying to avoid. And what what I, what I do then is I step aside. So I'll exit all my stock positions and go into cash, and I will let the market do what it's what it's going to do. If it continues to fall, obviously, and volatility increases, uh, particularly on the downside, then we'll be in cash and let that uh, let that run its course. So 2008 type situation, we would have been in cash for um, all bar nine weeks out of about 63 weeks. Uh, if if it doesn't, if the market doesn't continue to fall and turns around and, and starts rising again, and I'm talking about a medium term perspective here, then we will expose 100% of that of the investment cash to the market. And uh, of course, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't try to know what's going to happen. We just uh, we just let. The, the market do what it does and, and we react to the conditions accordingly. So in that case, we would then reinvest our capital and um, and let, if a trend develops and we have total exposure to the market, then that's when we make money. Right. So in your own trading, what type of impact does having a market timing indicator make on the overall results? Huge. Absolutely huge. I mean, we've done lots of research on this. Where we've just, we've uh, run historical simulations of running you know, thousands of simultaneous portfolios over over 12, 15 year periods, and we've compared the um, simulating running a stock portfolio by, <coughs> by being exposed to the market all the time, and so hence being exposed to up and down markets. Um, and we've also run uh, at the other end of the extreme when we get what we call a higher a high market risk environment where, where the market risk is saying to us there's a high probability the market might fall or become highly volatile and we get 100% into cash. So we've, we've, we've uh, simulated both those and we've, we've traded both those environments uh, in since 2001. So we've got real live trading uh, results and we've also got um, – We've also got simulated results, and undoubtedly there is a huge benefit in stepping aside when the market risk uh, looks like it's going to get high, and we may end up in a in a um, you know, high volatility environment. So it's undoubtedly that you're way ahead in doing that. There, there is a hybrid in the middle, Andrew, whereby when you get into high market risk, rather than exiting your portfolio entirely, you can go to 50% cash and leave 50% of your money invested. And whilst there are periods where that is uh, it's more beneficial to do that, over the long term, it's not. It's better to step aside in total. And I guess there's um, other um, benefits to having market timing, especially psychological uh, benefits to being able to stick with the strategy. A absolutely. Um, you know, the when you when you're running research over you know, two decades of of uh, historical portfolios, it's easy to sit there and see the big picture and say, oh, you know, it went down over there and I can see, you know, that we might have had a 30 or 40% drawdown because we didn't get out. But look, it recovered and we would have gone up again. Um, it's different from looking at it, you know, 20 years constantined onto onto one page, one A4 page, to actually living that. And uh, and it's it's in the living it that you, you got to have empathy for how human beings react. And human beings react very poorly to um, to things like drawdown and loss and et cetera, et cetera. And, and psychologically, very few people, in my view, having been doing this, you know, been running this business for 20 years now, very few people have the mental fortitude to be able to sit through a, you know, a drawdown of probably more than 20%. Yep, I think we've all done that. Uh, we've yeah. we've thought we could experience it or handle a drawdown like that, and then um, you know halfway through you're like, oh yeah. no, I can't do this. <laughs> There's no so. doubt, and what what it does is without having without us you know, naturally having that mental fortitude, I believe it can be it can be acquired through through practice and and you know and and uh, and doing doing the preparation, uh, living through it with a small amount of money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are techniques and drills and that that can be done to do it, but the very few of us have it have that mental fortitude naturally and without that mental fortitude it uh, it increases pressure and under pressure people make mistakes and 
when the pressure's really on, not only, not only do they make a mistake, they compound the mistake by trying to get it back and all sorts of things which are way outside their plan, but they 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 self sabotage themselves in, that, in those environments and and they well they also although they say they they won't do it when it happens, when it does happen they actually do do it. So it's an interesting point you make about perspective and um, well performing fund managers and uh, they can have drawdowns of years, but when you look at a an equity curve going way back, you know they they're just little blips. So that's um it's a good point to keep in mind when you are trading through a drawdown is to uh, keep perspective in mind. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I was showing just yesterday doing a webinar with our with our customers, and and I showed a an 85 year chart of the um, of the S and P 500, uh, and then just zoomed in on the two big secular bull markets we've had since in the 1940s to 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 late to early 60s, and then the 90, early 1980s to 2000. And uh, in in that second secular bull market from 1982 to 2000. There was a blip in the middle because we're looking at a log chart, not a not an arithmetic chart, uh, called the 1987 crash, and you can hardly see it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so when you're looking at a long-term chart like that, and you say, "Yeah, I would have just sat through that," um, very different uh, seeing it on a uh, seeing 85 years on a on a single chart to to living through you know what happened in 1987. Very very different. Yeah, right. So um, if we can continue on with the application of market timing techniques, you've uh, published a, a series of articles on your blog called Be Your Own Fund Manager. Uh, basically, they uh, it explores the way in which traders can use ETFs to outperform the vast majority of fund managers um, using timing techniques, which is quite interesting. So can you uh, discuss a little bit about those those articles? Yes, certainly. Um it is just position the, um, the 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 strategy or the approach first. You know, I've uh, I've been a, a technical analyst groupie uh, in uh, both here <laughs> in Australia uh, since the early 1990s, and I've you know, I've rubbed shoulders with a lot of um, educators, with a lot of investors, with a lot of our clients. Um, I've had the good fortune of having had a, a couple of mentors in the United States, had exposure to their clients and the way that people think. And you know, in this in this area of you know, being a technical analyst groupie, there are a lot of people that use technical analyst techniques where I'd, I'd describe them as 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 a technical analyst as being you know, advanced in in technical analysis. Uh, but when I when I've spoken to these people, both on a social basis and a professional basis, about how much of their capital, that the investment capital that they have, uh, how much of it do they apply, uh, you know, as a percentage-wise of their capital? How much do they actually uh, use the technical analysis skills they have to what percentage of capital? You know, undoubtedly, the majority of them would use their technical analysis skills on more than than at a maximum 20 to 25 percent of their capital the majority it's five to ten percent of their capital are that are they they're using technical analysis for trading options or cfds or short short to medium term trading stocks but they're only doing it with you know with somewhere between five and 20 to 25 percent of their capital the other 75 to 95 percent of their capital is, are sitting in in managed funds or mutual funds, either through uh, IRAs or uh, 401ks or through super funds, and they are sitting in you know, being managed by the so-called professionals. So, so the problem we have here is whilst these people have spent an, a huge amount of time on picking up technical analysis and timing skills, they're not applying it to the bulk of their capital. <laughs> Um, and you know, when you try and find out why, there's all sorts of excuses, but it, it effectively comes down to to fear, lack of confidence, um, and not so in a combination of of themselves and the financial markets. But they they've got the majority of their money being invested by these so-called professionals, who are uh, the stats have been out now for the last ten to fifteen years, who. Uh, Majority of them, when I say majority, I'm not talking 51%. I'm talking like 85% of them underperform the benchmark indices. Wow. Um, and I and I can give you some stats here, and I'll point people to to um, to a particular website. I'll mention it right now, hmm. where I've been following these guys uh, for the last four or five years. But I used to do the same the same uh, research that they do. I used to do myself. I used to get all the 
the the super fund uh, the super funds is to get all their data for the last uh, one three five years is to do it for all the active managed funds in Australia I get the last one three five and I do this every sort of six six to twelve months and I'd look at their returns their published returns and then measure that against the index and time after time after time you know I was do, I've been doing this since the early two thousands you'd find that the majority or the average super fund or the average managed fund return was that of the all ordinaries index not the all ordinaries accumulation index or not the ASX 200 accumulation index so so in australia that, that is that is underperformance by around about 3.8% compounded per annum that makes a big difference it's a huge difference you know on $100,000 over 10 years you're talking about $100,000 lost to the market wow um, it's 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 a, it's a huge and so when people are doing this, they, they might be you know, starting off in their twenties or thirties and they and they're putting money into a super fund and in, whether it's an industry super fund or not, uh, industry super funds do have lower costs, but they still underperform the benchmarks. And if you could do this yourself and just do the simple thing of going into just a, a, an ETF, a benchmark ETF like in Australia, the STW, um, and just reinvesting the dividends, uh, you are going to and I'll give you the stat right now. Over five years, you are going to beat 75% of the managed funds in Australia. <laughs> That's incredible. And in, in America, it's even worse. You know, they, they've got longer-term stats there, whereas uh, on the, over 10 years, 82.07% of managed funds underperform the S&P 500 total return index. Wow. And uh, it's, you know, so, 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 so to actually beat the fund managers – uh, all you got to do is invest in the in the index ETF and index ETF and reinvest the dividends, and you're going to put yourself in the top 15 to 25 percentile of uh, fund managers worldwide. It's that simple. Wow! But you're talking about a buy and hold arrangement there, aren't you? That's buy and hold and sitting yep. through you know 50 percent down markets. Absolutely. So a lot of people uh, can't sit through that kind of uh, drawdown, though. And well, on, for two reasons. One is psychologically, I think uh, most people would, uh, who are just keeping an eye on it, would would sell out. And and yeah, you know, we know now the proof is in from behavioural psychology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and you know, real hard life stats that come back is that most people would would hold on till the pain becomes too much, which is usually you know, thirty to forty to fifty percent drawdown. If we have that deeper mark, that deeper drawdown, similar to what we had in two thousand and eight. And um, that's fine, but what they wouldn't do is buy back in. So they'd, they'd wear the down and not uh, not benefit from the up. Right. So that's, I guess, where market timing comes into it. Correct. And that's uh, that's my that's the bandwagon I'm on at the moment is to say just by you know, spending fifteen minutes a week, uh, which is uh, you know half a TV sitcom or as much time as it takes to brush your teeth every week. Uh, if you can afford that that amount of time just to take your head out of the sand and uh, and put it put together some process whereby you might get in and out of the market you know two or three or four times a year over you know a long period of time, you uh, you will not only match the index, um, which would put you into the top you know, 15 percentile in the world, uh, you can do far better, which would take you to beyond what uh, active fund managers and even index uh, managers uh, can do. You, you would become you know, right up with the best in the world. Wow, it sounds so simple. And, and that's probably its, its biggest downfall, as people are expecting a huge amount of complexity. Yeah, okay. So uh, other than um, the cost, what, what other advantages do... Uh, do it yourself investors or traders have over the large funds well the um you, know, you, you start well, most people come to looking at these sorts of strategies and doing it themselves from a return perspective so they're looking at the dollars but you know i've been uh, in fact i just uh, was i just met with a friend this morning and had breakfast with him and he was uh, he was asking all these questions and i was taking it through with him you know he's a he's a high um he's a he's an executive on a large salary who just hasn't had time to look at his at his investments, um, but the the thing that uh, one of the things I left with them is having been uh, been ru been running a business for twenty years is that I've I've had the the fortune to have uh, sat down with with many tens of people over the years who are much older than me who've had a, a an investing problem they've needed to solve, and uh, these people who are. You know, who are coming up to retirement, who have been customers for long term, who now are retired, who have come to us for the first time when they're retired, there's two things I've learned from them. 
One is every single one of them say, I wish I'd started learning this stuff earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and the second thing that I learned from them is that whilst they, uh, the initial catalyst for them getting into managing their own finances is one of money and returns, uh, what they find out is, is that the biggest benefit they get is the intellectual um, stimulation and the and the and the 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 the, 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 the what do you call it the um, in, the intellectual stimulation, but also the, the 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 benefits they get of managing their own money and the feel good um, feelings that they get of having learnt the, uh, the 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 techniques, having learnt the skills, and them actually doing it themselves rather than putting their head in the sand and somebody else doing it. So those those warm fuzzies, the feelings they get from from having gained the skills and doing it themselves and seeing themselves doing better than what they otherwise would have done if they'd left it with somebody else to do, the uh, just the 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 heartfelt feelings they get from that is 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 is, is probably the biggest benefit they get rather than the financial returns. Right. So on your website, you offer a product called Spa3, which uh, works for various markets. Can you explain a little bit about that? Here, the Spa3 product is an active portfolio management system. It's uh, It's been around since 1998. Uh, it's available for both the Australian Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. It's one of, act, of actively managing uh, a portfolio of anywhere between 10 and 20 stocks, depending on size of capital. Um, whereby you are turning over your capital quite regularly and your average hold period in, in a trade would be six to eight weeks. So it's active and it, it would take uh, 15 to 20 minutes a day to, to manage that portfolio. It's returns because you are in, investing in, a, in stocks which are far more volatile than indices, uh, the, the potential for return is far greater than just buying and holding an ETF and reinvesting the dividends, but so is the time requirement. Mm. It, it, it does, it would, uh, it would, it certainly, you, you'd get out of the market when we have a uh, high market risk, so you go 100% into cash. Uh, but for people who, who don't want to have that amount of activity or think they might be able to, but, uh, and over many years, you know, um, feel that they can't continue to to have that amount of activity, we have also longer-term methodologies as well. Okay, sure. Thanks for explaining those. Yeah. So I'd just um, like to wrap up with a few quick uh, closing questions. Uh, what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Uh, the, the, the biggest lesson I've learned through trading is, is process. Um, it's... It's, it's, it's one of defining a process and uh, out of the heat of the market. So to, um, to, to be definitive in writing down a process that you will follow that, that, that will suit you. Uh, you know, for instance, the gentleman I mentioned, I, I, I spoke to this morning, you know, our SPAR3 ASX or NASDAQ products just not for him. But we have a SPA3 ETF product, which is which where you'd only turn over, you'd only time the market and be in and out you know, two to three times a year, is something that would lend itself more to him. But what I said to him is what you need to do is is write down what your mission is for your invest for your investing portion of your life, uh, what your goals and objectives are for that amount of money that you're gonna you're gonna actively manage. Uh, and then you need to very specifically write down the process that you're going to follow to achieve those goals and objectives. And it's the, it's the, it's the identification and stipulation and detail of the process you're going to follow. Everything in life requires process, whether it's a business, whether it's a fitness process, whether it's an eating process, whether it's a, a being a father process, <laughs> uh, whether it's being a golfer process. You, you need to have a process. You can't just walk up to the ball and hit it. You know, Ninety-five percent of the golf swing occurs before you hit the golf ball, not in the not in the process of hitting the golf ball. It's the it's the it's the preparation of hitting the golf ball, um, and it's the same with investing. You know, ninety-five percent of what you do with investing happens before you actually start investing. It's it's building that process, uh, identifying it through reading, through listening to podcasts like this, uh, and formulating something that's going to that's going to sit comfortably with you, writing that process down and then putting the steps in place to actually execute it. Oh, excellent. Thanks for that advice. Uh, you've already touched a little bit on this, but uh, what's the hardest part of trading? Undoubtedly, the short-term randomness that occurs in the market. Uh, no matter how robotic and mechanical you are, uh, you know, big down days um, have an effect. 
Mm. Uh, I'm running a portfolio in the States at the moment. Um, and uh, the I've got an open trade uh, that's that's sitting on about uh, 35% open profit. Uh, it's it's just been continuing to go up and up and up. And today I've woken up and looked at the portfolio and it's down 22% at oh, one stock. <laughs> 50% swing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but uh, and, and that undoubtedly having you know I've been mechanical trading now for uh, coming up for 18 years. Uh, in fact, a bit longer than that. It's probably 1997, so yeah, it is 18 years. And um, those still have an effect. The, you know, those outcomes still have an effect. But I know I've done my money management. The portion that that stock has uh, uh, of the exposure of my capital is 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 has been done because it's a volatile stock. It has a small amount of of uh, of capital compared to the other stocks in my portfolio. Um, I know these things happen. Uh, they're, they're part of the process. It's built in. Uh, I've researched and, and traded this, um, you know, th these portfolios. We've historically researched these portfolios. All the portfolios that we researched historically had these sorts of price movements in, so I know it's part of the game and I accept it. But having, having rationalized that, you know, when I looked at it and I saw minus 22% today, the heart still skipped mm -hmm. a beat. I still felt a little bit of pain. Uh, it's still there. And 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 being able to handle those those the day-to-day -day randomness of uh, of individual stocks and what happens in the market is 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 the thing that I think the one thing that takes people off their course and off their process and and you have to learn how to how to manage that. Uh, great insight there, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you share a personal habit or behaviour that you strongly believe contributes to your success? A big picture perspective. Um, it's it's one that I truly believe in in all parts of my life. It's uh, it's it's, it's it, it helps you get over the short term randomness. It's it's seeing the big picture. I know that um, the methodology, the process that I'm following, has a high probability of doing far better than the market over many years, uh, and that gives me the the confidence on a daily and a weekly basis to continue to execute the process no matter what happens. Uh, I know that uh, I will be out of the market when we have the next 50% bear market because my process will handle that. Uh, and having that big picture perspective you know, over the next three decades of my investing life, if I happen to have the be blessed to stick around that long, mm. is is I know that in that in the next three decades, there's going to probably be two, maybe three, maybe four big large bear markets that that are going to be of the order of you know 40 to 50 to 60 percent bear markets. But uh, I'll, my process will handle that, and it's that big picture perspective that it helps me to to execute in the context of a day on a daily basis the short term randomness that occurs. Right. And what's a favorite trading book or books? Uh, the one that I that I that I tell everybody to read who who are going to be become active. When I say active, I mean more on a short to medium term basis. Is uh, Mark Douglas's Trading in the Zone. It's uh, it's an absolute. It is the iconic material for active investors. It, it's it's all about trading psychology. And I think anybody who's going to be active and be turning over lots of trades needs to not only read that book, but but study it. Study it as if you're going to write an exam on it. Yeah, right. Now, I know you use a lot of quotes in your blog posts. So I just have to ask, what's your favorite quote? Uh, well, one, one that probably hasn't been in my, in my – I'll give you two. How's that? I've got that sounds pinned, great. Pinned in my wall over here. I love quotes. <laughs> okay. Um, is – the word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. <laughs> That's cool. So listen is an anagram of silent. Mm. Uh, another one which I wrote up here, which is uh, which I have used, and, and this one has been in the blog, um, is, uh, and this is by a chap by the name of Michael Rogers, who's an Australian cyclist. And this absolutely pertains to trading. He made this in July last year when he won I think after 10 years of trying, uh, of riding in the uh, Tour de France, he actually won a stage. And in the interview afterwards on TV, the quote that stood out to me, which I just wrote down, is opportunities seem clearer to me now that I'm not scared of the outcome. Wow. 
That's a cyclist saying that, not a, not a trader. <laughs> <laughs> well, I find a lot of um, quotes from sports um, apply to trading as well due to the discipline aspect. Yeah. I mean, that's just absolutely mm. brilliant. Opportunities seem clearer to me now that I'm not scared of the outcome. And I'll give you one more. This, and this is a, uh, I think this is a Confucius says one, but it's this one that applies to trading as well. Is luck happens when preparedness meets opportunity. <laughs> That's a good one too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like that. Okay. So finally, what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Through uh, sharewellsystems.com. Uh, is is our is our web page. Uh, they can put in the email address there, or they can call us on one three hundred stocks. Uh, that obviously only applies in Australia. One three hundred stocks, and uh, or they um, they they can they can. Uh, those are probably the two easiest ways of doing it. Yeah. Okay, great. So thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us today, Gary. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap up? No. Uh, Maybe just a little bit of inspiration. Uh, yeah, in, in my view, sure. in my view, um, trading the financial markets, investing in the financial markets is is one of the biggest mental challenges that um, that anybody can take on. And and I see it as a medium. I see it as the single medium that is uh, that is the or, or the best medium for for self uh, self growth. Uh, to grow as, as a person and a human being, the things that the market throws at you, if you can handle those and build a process to handle those, it will rub off on all the other phases of your life, whether it be sport or relationships or business or whatever it is, you, you'll get better at those those other aspects of your life. Oh, well, that's a great insight. Thanks. Uh, what a way to finish off. Yeah. Um, so I highly recommend everyone check out Gary's website and blog at sharewealthsystems.com to um, have a look at more of his work. For those listeners based in Australia, he'll be presenting at a number of ATA members meetings this year, so look out for him. Um, thanks for your time today, Gary. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Andrew. Thanks, Gary, for a great chat today. How did you enjoy that? Here are my top takeaways from this episode. Time in the market is not about being in the market for the best days, but rather being out for the worst days. Gary's research has shown that the best and worst days of the market are usually in a close proximity to each other. So if you end up missing both the best and the worst days, your returns are far better than just being in the market all the time. There are loads of ways to implement market timing and Gary provided a bunch of examples for us. So check out the notes um, for more details. There was a quote of Gary's that I really liked too. It was, big picture perspective helps me execute on a daily basis. This is a great one for the times when trading is difficult, which is often usually, I guess, in a drawdown. So if you check the results of some of the fund managers that have been trading 20, 30, 40 plus years, you'll often see long periods of time where performance wasn't that great. But when you zoom out, look at the results over the long term, putting those poor periods into perspective, they seem much less significant. Acknowledging that can help us all in our own trading, uh, keeping the big picture perspective in mind. I was also quite surprised with the stats Gary quoted showing 82% of funds underperform the S&P 500 total return index over a 10-year period. So, if you want to beat the majority of fund managers worldwide, all you need to do is invest in an index ETF and reinvest the dividends. So simple, but of course, you could do even better with some simple market timing techniques. They were my top takeaways. What were yours? Leave a comment in the show notes. It'd be great to hear what you thought. Don't forget to check the show notes actually for this episode. Uh, we have additional resources discussed in our chat. The show notes for episode 8 can be accessed directly by going to bettersystemtrader.com slash 8. Next week's guest has over 35 years experience as an investment professional focusing on underexploited investment opportunities. His award-winning research on momentum investing combines relative strength price momentum with trend following absolute momentum and that's exactly what we talk about in our chat. We discuss the different types of momentum, how they can be used in a strategy, the benefits and challenges of momentum and how it can be modified to suit individual needs. This is a great episode to listen to if you're into momentum or not so make sure you don't miss out. Anyway, that's it for this session. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Gary Stone this week. Thanks for listening to Better System Trader. I'll catch you next week. Bye. 
Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Thank you.